This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Ting. You can actually take the online exact practice exams for free. So there's a couple of those as well. That's interesting. I didn't realize that it's actually the amateurs that are testing the potential amateurs within the radio clubs. It's, it's not formalized through the government or, no. or, or how does that work? I guess they submit paperwork back to the FCC. Because from what I understand, in order to do any of this, you have to become licensed, you get a call sign, and, and then you have to transmit that. I, you know, that's about the extent of my knowledge on that. Absolutely. So, um, so th what the FCC does is they regulate the airwaves, right? They control all the airwaves in the in the U.S. as you know, and they work with reciprocating uh, governments as well, um, and they regulate um, the licensing for the ham radio operator. The training, though, is actually on the part of the clubs and the amateurs and the volunteers that support um, amateur radio. And so they do the, the regulation part, the licensing part, but as far as, the, and, the, and the testing, they actually do the testing um, where you have trained um, instructors that are volunteers. Normally they usually have one or two proctors or folks that can actually administer the test and then they will score the exam and then they will forward those results to the FCC who then processes the paperwork, puts you in a database and then will mail you your certificate with your call sign. So they, they do the administrative stuff but not so much the training stuff but they control the uh, the testing and the questions, the test banks, all that kind of thing. So they've got people that actually volunteer to help put together the testing and the questions, but then um, the actual individual clubs for the cities actually uh, have a proctor that actually administer it. And so the FCC will license you to be able to broadcast on VHF or UHF here in the United States. And now I, I can only assume, is it like, uh, like Wi-Fi and how that on the ISM band, um, like say 2.4 gigahertz, uh, we have uh, 11 channels available to us. And then the, uh, the International Telecommunications Union uh, works with other countries around the world to make sure that all of those frequencies are the same no matter where you go. So, you know, if you go to Japan, the same, you know, channel 13, there's channel 13. Um, I guess we can't ha use that in the U.S. It, see, I, I understand Wi-Fi and I understand that, that, that that's the aspect of it, that the ITU makes sure that everybody's on the same frequency. Do you have to, you know, is there like a, is that an issue when it comes to ham or, you know, is VHF VHF everywhere? Uh, that's that's a great question. So yes, the the FCC works with all the other governmental bodies around the world, and they came up with standards. And so basically, one forty four dot you know five five zero frequency is the same as it is in uh, South America. And um, there's what they call reciprocal licensing. So basically, I could even go to Canada, for example, and broadcast from Canada, because if the US has a reciprocal license with that country, we can travel back and forth. Same for the frequencies, right? Um, the frequencies are the same, whether they're here or in China. Um, some frequencies are more restrictive, obviously, um, like fire and police and military, they have their own bands. Um, but there's a there's a very wide range of common bandwidth, common bands that we all communicate on. That's that's the whole thing for um, for amateur radio is we want to be able to, to pick up the frequency and call somebody in China or call somebody over in Europe. Um, so they've worked very hard for it, and it's, this has been around for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So they've worked out the frequencies, the reciprocal agreements. You know, it's, it's, it's all pretty much done now. And it's not like anybody or any country can like opt out. It's, you know, because the, the inherent nature of radio, if you want to broadcast on this frequency to China, yeah. China doesn't get to say at their borders, you know, no, no frequencies coming here. Exactly. What, some of the restrictive countries, for example, uh, North Korea. Um, you know, they do not uh, allow uh, ham radio operators because they don't want information to leak out. So what they do is they restrict the ownership of a radio. They can't really control the airwave, but they can control the hardware, meaning not letting it get in there and letting people use it. Um, so there are some countries that are very restrictive and they don't allow people to, to legally be a, uh, an amateur radio operator. But for the most part, a lot of countries do, including China and uh, Japan. Japan's one of the, the, the largest um, you know, uh, uh, have folks that have a ham radio operator licensing. So tell me about some of the restrictions here in the United States. I mean, obviously the restriction is I can't just go out, buy a radio and start transmitting um, without a license. So one, I have to get licensed and then you get a call sign. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming part of the paperwork is actually registering in the database, kind of like a who is database of like, Very, yes, yeah. So here's my name, here's my address yeah. and all of that stuff. So there. there's your identification. 
Um, and address. Uh, and right. so what about uh, monitoring, for instance? So when you use um, ham radio or packet radio, can you use encryption to thwart monitoring, or at least make monitoring less important because it is thus encrypted? Great question. All right. So the premise of um, amateur radio, which was started about 100 years ago, um, and in fact, this December, it'll be 100 years since it was the birth of amateur radio. It was on the premise that um, it would be a very low cost license issued by the government on the premise that it's for general public use, meaning that security wasn't wasn't around at the time. So everything was open right and packet radio wasn't available at the time so it was all just voice communications as time has marched on uh, the pc has met the radio hence we have uh, uh, airmail and these kind of things to do um, do packet radio Um, but technically the rules have still governed by the fcc that um, uh, it's not to be you know profanity you're not you're supposed to have a good code of conduct um, and you're supposed to broadcast your um, your station identification every every basically 10 minutes in some form. And that could be, you know, either voice or through a system. That, uh, basically, it's like Morse code. Um, but you're not supposed to technically encrypt data over the FCC airwaves. Now, whether people do that or not, that's up to how they do it. Um, but as per the FCC definition, you're not supposed to broadcast uh, encrypted data. Can you, can you get fines or go to jail if you're actually like, say for instance, I want to send email, but I want to use like PGP to encrypt it with like public and private keys. I send that over VHF, uh, the FCC hears that, they can't decode it, they get upset. Uh, am I going to Guantanamo Bay? I mean, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, they do. Okay, so there are people that monitor the airwaves. Um, basically, uh, they're volunteers for the FCC. And um, in the old days, um, you know, the kind of the old timers didn't get involved in email and broadcasting and encryption data type things. So the world's changed now. And now we have younger people coming out. They know about PGP. They know about encryption. You know, I want to send this email that's encrypted somehow. Um, the the rules had stated that there was to be no um, no security that were uh, an inspector, meaning one of these people that volunteered to, to make sure that um, rules are being followed, didn't have access to. So the rules state that the inspector is still supposed to be able to have access to this data. So so as if you were supposed to, you could use. PGP, for instance, if, say, you published your private key openly and thus, or, yeah. or gave it to the inspector and thus, <laughs> you know, nullifying the whole point? Good point there, yeah. Again, that goes back to, um, you know, the whole amateur radio system mm-hmm. was designed as a hobbyist type thing. And uh, and it's supposed to be open. It's open system, open shared. Uh, whether people um, do their security, you know, is is really how they do it, how they manage their their um, their data flow. Um, but their, their their FCC rules are pretty clear as to what you can do, what you can't do, and that's part of your job as an amateur radio operator is to find out what these rules are. Will they change that to say, okay, we can allow a person to encrypt data at their at their um, computer and then transmit it and that's that's still under discussion right now mm-hmm. but right now it's a public domain um it's kind of like you know they can't cuss listening to your favorite radio station on the air you know there's rules and co- uh, conduct to follow it's the same thing with with being an amateur radio operator so i think things are going to change um but right now they're they're pretty strict as to open communication for everybody you know we're not going to keep any secrets and whatnot no those kind of things um i think as uh uh, younger people come in that can help change some of those rules but right now that's they're they're pretty strict on that that's kind of interesting to think of like how I've been going off lately about how much I love Ting, and it is for good reason. This is actually my personal setup. I've got two accounts with Ting. I love these devices. It has been rock solid. And let me tell you, I am so happy to see that you guys have been checking out the service too. They are doing some fantastic jobs, shaking up the cell industry with their customer first approach, and it is a godsend. If you haven't heard what I'm talking about, Ting is an awesome service that brings clarity, usability, and big savings to mobile phone users. So Ting, get this, just has one simple plan, honest offerings, it's megabytes, minutes, and text messages all billed separately. I know it's so great. You don't have to get some package. You don't have to worry about, you know, going over some plan and having some ridiculous fees. You just pay one fee 
For each thing, it's no BS, real simple. Check it out at ting.com slash hack5. They've got an online savings calculator. And if you're ready to get started, get this, they're gonna hook Hack5 fans up with $75 off your first month of service just for being a Hack5 viewer. It's so cool. All you have to do is go over to ting.com slash hack5 and the coupon will be activated. It's just that simple with Ting. They're pretty strict on that. That's kind of interesting to think of like how that, uh, you know, uh, compares to the internet where, um, you know, as far as monitoring is concerned, you can use whatever encryption you want. Um, as far as identification is concerned, there's, you know, ways to get online without having to, well, obviously you don't need a license to be on the internet as we know from YouTube comments. And um, <laughs> you don't, you know, you could potentially be anonymous if you go through enough hoops. Um, of course, Con the difference there is that there's the control. I mean, as we saw in like Egypt, a whole country can just turn off the internet. Um, you can't turn off VHF. You can't turn off HF. I mean, I'm sure you could jam it, but for the most part, um, you know, nobody can just press a button and turn off all the ham radio operators. Uh, that very good, very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, that's where um, it, the the government. I think and I'm just speaking you know in my thoughts that the government's saying hey if you have if if you're broadcasting you got to follow our rules because we're their fcc rules um but we have to be allowed to at least you know inspect you know we have to listen to your voice you know and make sure that you're not cussing and, and saying profanity it's fascinating because online you can say whatever you want you yeah. know there's no limitation you can drop f-bombs all day long Absolutely, you can. Um, but but uh, it was kind of like like I said, it was a hobbyist gentleman's uh, club that was formed a hundred years ago with, with a proper with, etiquette with the content police saying like, oh, I, I don't approve of of the kind of stuff you're saying. But I mean, we've seen that time and time again with like you know shock jocks on FM radio. So yeah, same kind of thing. Um, but I think like I said I think the security things are going to change at the at the at the computer level. It's just a matter of changing the FCC rules. I'll give you another example. Remember, you know, if you look at a clock radio and it says, you know, this device has to accept interference from FCC Part 15. Part 15 yeah. That's me. Okay. So that means that I, I technically, now it is kind of funny, but my, my amateur radio can interfere with your clock radio because I actually trump the rules over your clock radio. So if you get static and fuzzy stuff, the rules protect me saying that I can broadcast and, you know, sorry about having interference with your clock radio. Now, the also rules state that you need to try to mitigate, use filters and these kind of things to prevent any harmful interference to a device. But the rules and the laws state that I have authority over you, including your TV. So if I, if I uh, you know, interfere with your TV transmission when I broadcast and I key the mic, sorry. And then, you know, but I'll, I sh I'm supposed to help mitigate to put filters on and turn the power down or whatnot. So it's a double edged sword. So what I find fascinating about uh, ham radio and packet radio in particular is that unlike Wi-Fi, uh, you can cross Kansas. And so while there has been so many fascinating mesh networking groups, uh, Seattle is known for their fantastic wireless user groups that, uh, you know, put together these mesh networks, these community networks that are outside the band of the Internet that cannot be controlled uh, the same way that the Internet is, cannot be, you know, uh, the, you know, there, you can mitigate monitoring. You, you don't have the same kind of identification aspects and you, you can do whatever content you want over those networks. Um, they're still localized. And the only way to really connect them to other, you know, mesh networks, there's some fantastic ones that I just learned about in like Cape Town. Um, the only way that Cape Town's going to speak to Seattle's uh, mesh network is over like an existing line or over uh, or, or, or how else would you do it? And so that's why I'm fascinated with um, ham radio in that it's, you know, out of band and actually has the kind of power. To, to actually broadcast globally, to actually cross Kansas, because you're not gonna do that with a bunch of Wi-Fi repeaters. Absolutely, that's right. Um, like I said, you know, we have the options where we can bounce signals off satellites, we can bounce signals off the moon, 
Um, we can do a slow scan TV. You can actually broadcast over uh, amateur radio with TV, which you, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yeah. Um, so the cool thing about uh, amateur radio is there are lots of options. We have lots of frequencies and we have lots of tools and it's been around for a long but time. It seems like you also have a lot of limitations, you know, as far as like you have to get licensed, you can't broadcast this. And so when I look at those community networks and like, how would you link those up? Uh, it, it seems like technically feasibility wise, totally there, uh, but legally wise, not so much. Very true. Everything you're saying is very true. We have lots of technologies and things. We can do lots of hacking and lots of melding together of technology between Wi-Fi, cellular, microwave, all those things that technology exists where we can inter interact and interface with a lot of different things, but it does go back to the rules and goes back to the FCC laws. So. Sorry about that. No <laughs> uh, well, what about what about some of the uh, other frequencies? I mean, there's uh, GMRS, there's MURS, there's um, uh, FRS, the the family radio systems, the general radio systems, the multi-use radio Mars, systems. The yeah, yeah, yeah. System. So, yeah. so consumers can use those. I know with GMRS, you have to like you do actually have to get a license in that case. But I think you just send a ten dollar bill to the FCC and they say have fun. Yeah. Um, you know, can you do packet radio over anything? Or are you limited to only doing it over VHF and UHF? Um, uh, VHF, UHF, HF. Um, yeah, um, it, that's pretty much what it was designed for. Was over. But if you or, if you plugged your TNC, your yeah. your equivalent of a modem, a modulator, demodulator, just turns your bits into radio uh, instead of the telephone. You plugged it into an FRS radio, um, and you got you know five, ten, fifteen miles range on that. Mm -hmm. Is that legit? Um, yeah, actually, I haven't worked with um, FRS, Family Radio System. It's kind of like with Mars. Mars is the military, something where you can actually talk from radio to a family member in Germany or something. Uh, yeah, yeah um, I haven't worked with the Family Radio Services um, using packet radio, um, or I haven't worked with Mars or any of those other ones. Um, but been mostly with Echolink, Winlink, and some of the you know the commercial stuff. Um, I'm sure you probably could do packet radio over the family radio services, but I haven't interfaced with that particular network before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just fascinated by the idea of like, you know, like, oh, once I realized like, wow, there's this whole packet radio thing. And really, it's just basically the same thing we're doing short range, high bandwidth with Wi-Fi. Yes. How cool would it be to use something? And my hang up is always, you know, the license, the identification, the content restriction, things of that nature. So, um, but okay, so let's dial it back a little and start talking about the gear. So we go out, we get our license. Yep. Uh, we get our call sign, we took those classes. So now we're educated and empowered, but now we've got a, a laptop and we wanna start broadcasting emails and, and receiving stuff. How, how do we go about that? No, oh, great questions. So yeah, um, so we know that there's, there's, uh, there's eBay, there's a uh, ham radio outlet and other stores that are um, mail order or click uh, brick and mortar stores. Um, we join a club, and once you get into a, some kind of a radio club, um, those folks start to train you and teach you how to use packet radio and what frequencies to use. And normally a club will have its own frequency, so you can communicate with those members and whatnot. Um, uh, the, um, the, uh, there, there's, uh, there's the, uh, the uh, there's a couple of different national um, uh, uh, organizations for ham radio as well too. And so they, they can provide books. Um, they also have videos online. There's some, there are some stuff on YouTube now on videos. Um, so basically to transmit, I mean, I have, I literally built a, a Pentium three mm -hmm. laptop out of parts. I mean, it was, I was, it was out of two or three broken laptops nice. and uh, I sat on my kitchen table. Um, I put uh, a new screen in one keyboard on this other and I kind of Frankenstein this machine together. So it had a serial port on it. Um, my TNC has a serial port ran, you know, the other serial port into the, into the, um, into my uh, radio and uh, poof. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm broadcasting. That's it. That's it. So, so just a radio and a TNC and there you go. And a laptop. Yeah. Yep. And so what do each of those components do? Okay.